Turn with me, if you would, this morning, John chapter 21. John chapter 21, if you need a Bible, there's one in the seat back in front of you. There should be. Um, John chapter 21 this morning. Uh, we ended a series last week we called True-ish, um, talking about these different distinguishing marks of followers of Christ. Next week, we're going to kick off a series through the book of James. We're excited about that, uh, to be able to journey through a book of the Bible, which is our favorite thing to do. Um, and we're going to be journeying through the book of James, which I believe is essential to understand if you want to live a life to the glory of God as a follower of Jesus Christ. And so uh, we're kind of on the in-between, and we like to kid around with our staff whenever we're kind of in-between series. Uh, we like to pull in these what we call one-hit wonders. Um, these kind of one-time deals that we can get just a uh, look at uh, and just kind of challenge our lives with. And so that's kind of our joke, uh, a one-hit wonder this morning. It's a one-time part of a series, uh, not really part of a series, but just a one-time deal. John chapter 21. Uh, as we dive in, how many of you remember one of these? Come on. Nintendo, this... These were the greatest game consoles ever made. Now, young people, I know you're looking and you're like, well, I've got the Xbox 360. Oh, I've got the PlayStation 4. You know, you have not played games until you play Nintendo. This thing is sweet. I remember when these things came out, it was, oh, this is the crave. Everybody wanted to have a Nintendo. Anybody remember the game that came with the Nintendo, like the number one game? Super Mario Brothers. Remember that? Now, some had Duck Hunt, but let's be honest, Super Mario Brothers. In fact, do you realize that in 2006, I believe it was, Super Mario Brothers was called the greatest game of all time. Greatest game of all time. I love that thing. I remember when it came out. I, by the way, this uh, I, I shared a story with somebody about how I love those old like Ataris and things, and somebody in our church collects them. And they said, hey, do you, do you want a Nintendo? I'm like, are you kidding me? I began to cry. And um, I love, I mean, this is, comes back, I mean, it kind of ages, right? But I remember Super Mario Brothers in 1985, like it was launched out. And I mean, everybody wanted it. Um, I was like, that would be awesome. I mean, do you mean actually working? So I actually have one that works. I get to play it. Um, and so if you like to play, you know, I'd love to have you come over and play uh, a little Nintendo with me, a little Super Mario Brothers, a little Mike Tyson's Punch Out. Love those games. Anyway, I remember Super Mario Brothers. Remember this? It had eight worlds with four stages in each world. So meaning there are 32 levels in Super Mario Brothers. And the whole realm of Super Mario Brothers was you were the character Mario, unless you played two players and then you had Luigi. Um, but Mario was trying to... Uh, trying to get back the princess who had been kidnapped by the evil browser. Remember that? Browser. And so you play this whole game, and there's all these hidden worlds in there. Remember that? Like if you could fly up to the top of one of them, jump to the top, you could go automatically to level four right from the very first world. Remember that little secret? Um, and you had to figure these out. There were no cheat codes, young people, online. I know how some of you play games now. You go online and look for the cheat code because you don't know how to play the game by yourself. Seriously, I'm telling you. I, my kids do that, and I'm like, guys, why don't you play it and try to beat it? And, and so they're playing these you know, little sports games. Oh, I want to get the cheat code so I can have that outfit. And Oh, whatever. Um, we had to figure those things out on our own back in the day. Uh, and so I remember you would play. Now, when you played Super Mario Brothers, and you got, as you started to get better and better, you start to realize what you had to do to beat the game. I remember like it was yesterday, the day I beat Super Mario Brothers. And, and you know... I remember the fanfare wasn't that phenomenal, but the excitement of beating it to be able to say I beat it. And so I remember at the end, right, you had Bowser who would throw these fiery darts at you and you had to run under or over, jump over them, and get to the end and there would be princess. And the end, there wasn't like balloons from the sky or there wasn't like a championship trophy. All it was was you and princess standing there to this really corny music, right? That's all it was. But to beat it was awesome. And I remember the day I beat Super Mario Brothers. But I had to learn some things along the way. You had to have a certain amount of lives in order to beat it on the 32nd level on World 8. Like if you didn't have that many lives, you weren't going to win. You had to have a certain amount of lives. And I learned to memorize how many lives I needed to have. And how I did that 
with a, with a really, really great button that if, so, so let's say you go to World 1 and you begin to play the game. And I remember, you know, World 1 was very easy. You jumped over a few mushrooms, you hit a few blocks, you get 100 coins, you get a free, 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 free life. And so you're playing this thing and you would sometimes go fast because it was so easy. And what would happen is you would fall off the cliff or you would accidentally run into a mushroom. Remember those mushrooms? And you would die. Well, this little button right here, anybody know what that button is? There's a second button in. That's the restart button. So you would be playing the game and you knew you had to have so many lives in order to beat it. And if you didn't get that many lives or you actually didn't go that far, you would just go bloop. So you'd be on level four and you'd be like almost trying to get there. You're trying to find these and it just wouldn't go the way you want it to go. And so you only had five lives instead of six lives. And you knew that it took five, six lives to beat the game. Boop. Restart. And you go back to the beginning. You run through it again. You do This restart button was phenomenal. You could restart that game as easy as could be, and you could start from the beginning, and you knew how far you had to get. Now, how many of you wish that life had a restart button? Anybody? Anybody here wish you could just push a button and go back and redo something? Now, I dare say probably all of us here wish we could go back and do things a bit differently. Do we not? Like, if you, as you grow, you realize there's a lot of things I could have done differently back then if I only knew what I knew now. The problem is we know if we go back, you can't do them the way uh, with the knowledge that we have now. And so, uh, but we love to have this restart button. Maybe you're here this morning. You wish, man, I wish life just was like that. I wish there was a reset button that I could just do it over. Maybe, maybe it's a circumstance where you lost your cool, right? You said something you shouldn't have said to your spouse. Restart. Maybe for you, it was something, a decision that you made that affected the outcome of a situation. And you just wish you could hit the button. Restart. Let's go back and redo it. Now, the reality is we can't, and we know that. Uh, we have to live with the consequences of our action. But I want to ask you this question this morning. I want us to consider this idea of restarting this morning. And this question goes right to the heart of everything here this morning we're going to talk about. How many of you, if you could just go back for a moment and you could think of the moment you failed the most or a moment in your life where you would say is the biggest failure of your life, what is the one thing that you look back in your life and you say, you know, I regret that more than anything else in my life. I wish I could go back and restart. What's the one thing you wish you could redo? Now, I dare say a lot of things maybe come in your mind. For you, maybe it was a regret that you had in marriage. Maybe it was a failed marriage. Maybe for you, it was a relationship that was not the right relationship you, you, you should have had. And so you wish you could hit the restart button. For others, maybe you look at your kids. Your kids have grown up, and they're not following Christ. And you look back as a parent, and you wish you could hit the restart button and go back and redo how you taught them and what you, how you led them. For, for others of you, maybe it's you wish you could go back and you could make a little change of your career, like you had some direction and something happened and it changed the outcome of your life. And so you wish you could go back and you could redo your career. For others, maybe it was your promiscuous lifestyle. Like you wish you could go back and you could undo that lifestyle that you lived for so many years, that lifestyle of sin. For some, maybe it was even something somebody else did for you. Now, I want to pause here for a moment because I want to, want to kind of flip the page on us because all of us here have moments of failure. All of us here have moments that we regret. All of us here have moments. And I don't know about you, but I look at my own life. And I've, I, I accepted Christ back when I was a young person. I've been saved for about 25 years. I accepted Christ when I was 8. I'm 35. Um, so I've, I've, I knew, I've known Christ for about 25 years in, in some form or fashion. And I can say at times, even though I've known Christ for a long time, I feel at times like a stumbling, bumbling, stuttering in my attempt to follow him. Like at times I feel like his presence is so real that I, I am overwhelmed in tears, and other times I feel like he's nowhere to be found. You ever feel that way in your spiritual life? Maybe you're here, and, and, and some days you feel like your faith, as I do, sometimes my faith is strong, it's impenetrable, it's immovable, I'm going to take the mountain without reservation. And then there are other times where my faith feels weak, pathetic, helpless, knocked around like a styrofoam cup in the middle of the ocean in the middle of a hurricane. Sometimes I feel that way, and I wish that I could be like Paul and say, imitate me as I imitate Christ, uh, when in fact I feel like a, a bona fide failure at times. You ever feel that way? And, and there are times where I just wish I could hit reset. 
I wish I could restart and try again. Now, in my observation of people and an observation of my own life is how I deal with that. I would dare say this morning that for most of us, if we're being really honest, we have created a restart button in our life to deal with our failures. I would dare say that most of us have attempted to try to undo or redo some things in our life or run to certain things that can satisfy us. I would dare say that probably most of us, we have run or created a restart button that will never undo what we've done, but at least it's a place we run when those things don't go our way. So let me be honest for a moment. For some of you, things start to go haywire. And I see these cycles in our lives. I see it in my life, and I see it in a lot of Christians' lives. So, so things are going well, then all of a sudden, something is decided, something is said, something is done. There's failure. There's a feeling of overwhelm. There's a feeling of despair, maybe. There's a feeling, maybe it's sin, maybe it's not. Maybe it's I've gotten overwhelmed in work, or I've gotten overwhelmed in this habit. And what ends up happening is we try to run and find a restart button. For some of you, your restart button is sinful. Maybe for you, it's pornography. Maybe you run to pornography in a moment of crisis, in a moment of failure. You run to something sinful because it satisfies you for temporary means. Others of you here, in that moment where you know failure happens or despair happens, you run to uh, finding, uh, kicking back alcoholic beverages. For some of you, maybe it's drugs. Let's just be honest. I mean, that's we do live in Hagerstown here. There are drugs rampant. It's an escape, right? It's a restart. I can go kind of find a restart. For others of you, you go buy, you go, let's go, cigarettes, habits, anything, you name it, it can become a restart. Now some, maybe it's not necessarily sinful, but for you, you run to the cycle of career, right? I'm going to work more. I'm going to work harder. I'm going to spend longer hours. I'm going to try to figure this thing out because I just, I feel like a failure in this area, so I'm going to run to this area where I can feel like success. We, man, there's so many restart buttons that you can find in your life. But we know the only place that we can run in those moments, we know it intellectually, but do we do it faithfully, is to run to Christ. Now, I want to show you this story this morning from the scriptures that is all about restart. It's all about this restart. Take a look at this, John chapter 21. And I believe we're going to see the defaults of life at play in this story. John chapter 21. Now, let me explain what's happening. Jesus has risen from the dead. He died on the cross, rose from the grave, he has demonstrated himself to his disciples on two occasions. The Bible does not give us a long conversation with his disciples. All we see is him showing up. The only really deep conversation we see Jesus having with his disciples is with doubting Thomas. Remember, that he appeared to the disciples except for Thomas. Of course, Judas is gone. And he's, Thomas comes in and says, listen, I'm not going to believe unless I see the, the nail scars in his hands. Unless I see his feet, I'm not going to believe. And Jesus then shows up in their midst. And he, with this de great declaration, John 20, 28, one of my favorite verses, my Lord and my God. He saw the resurrected Christ and his response was, oh, man, you are God. You are the Lord and God. Now we come to chapter 21, and this gives us, again, the, the third time Jesus is going to appear to the disciples. Again, brief moments, but nothing deep in this way. So John is going to lay out for us the story of how he, Jesus revealed himself. Verse 2, Simon Peter, Thomas called the twin, Nathaniel of Cana in Galilee, the sons of Zebedee, who we know are James and John, they're called the sons of Zebedee or the sons of thunder, and two other of his disciples were together. So now we have seven disciples gathered together. We don't have all 11. Judas is gone. 11 of them remain. We have seven of them. The clear majority are gathered together by this sea. Now notice what happens, verse 3. Simon Peter says to them, I'm going fishing. They said to him, we will go with you. And they went out and got into their boat. Let's stop right there for a moment. I'm going to go fishing. Let's consider for a moment why that's unique. Jesus had risen from the grave. Yet what are they doing? Let's go fishing. Now this goes back, and I want to take a moment, because we're going to look at the life of Peter just for a brief moment, and specifically in this text. But I want to go back and review for us a little bit about Peter. Do you remember Peter, Simon Peter, uh, kind of renamed Peter by Jesus, the rock? Let's go back. Turn back with me, if you would, Luke chapter 5. We're going to have some verses on the screen, but I want to look at this one together, Luke chapter 5. Because I find it very unique that this story in Peter's life begins in the same place that this story is going to kind of end here in the Gospels. Luke chapter 5. 
Luke chapter 5, verse 1. It says, On one occasion, while the crowd was pressing in on Jesus to hear the word of God, Christ was preaching and they were pressing in. He was standing by the lake of Gesenareth. That's the same place, um, just named differently. And he saw two boats by the lake, but the fishermen had gone out of them and were washing their nets, getting into one of the boats, which was Simon's. And he asked him to put out a little from the land, and he sat down and taught the people from the boat. And when he had finished speaking, he said to Simon, put out into the deep and let, your nets, let down your nets for a catch. And Simon answered, said, Master, we have toiled all night, and we've taken nothing. He said, we have not been very successful in our job. We have taken no fish. But at your word, I will let down the nets. And when they had done this, they enclosed a large number of fish, and their nets were breaking. They signaled to the partners in the other boats to come and help them. And when they came, they filled both of the boats so that they began to sink. But when Simon Peter saw it, he fell down at Jesus' knees and he said, Depart from me, for I am a sinful man, O Lord. For he and all who were with him were astonished at the catch of the fish that they were taken. And so also were James and John, the sons of Zebedee, who were partners with Simon. And Jesus said to Simon, Do not be afraid. From now on you will be catching men. And when they had brought boat, their boats to land, they left everything and followed him. So here we have this great story. Here they are fishing. They're not catching anything all night. Jesus shows up. They begin to catch. He tells them to cast the nets on the other side, go out to the deep. They catch all these fish, which the deep wasn't the place you catch the fish, but they did. And they're astonished. And Jesus says, now follow me and I will make you fishers of men. And now if, you're, if you grew up in church, you know the song, right? I will make you fishers of men, right? And for me, I was one of those active kids in class, so I would be like, and I will make you fishers of men, right? That's the way we did it, right? And, you know, whoever could cast it out farther got the bigger fish, so fishers of men, and we pulled back, right? That was me in class. I was one of those that could never be still, and teachers probably didn't, didn't like it very much, but I, fishers of men, right? If you follow me, right? that's as good as it gets for me, guys, uh, singing there, all right? If you follow me. Right, follow him, I'll make you fishers of men. So here's that great text, Peter following. And it says he dropped his nets, he dropped his career, he dropped all that he did, and he followed Christ. Now, this story begins to have ups and downs. Peter becomes the, 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 the leader of the disciples. Now watch, because if you read his story, you find these ups and these downs. So let me show you a few. You can turn to them or they'll be up on the screen. Matthew 16, consider this. This is a pinnacle moment in Peter's life. Now, when Jesus came into the district of Caesarea Philippi, he asked his disciples, who do people say that the Son of Man is? And some said John the Baptist, others say Elijah, some Jeremiah, or one of the prophets. But he said to them, Jesus said, but who do you say that I am? And notice Simon Peter's responses. Simon Peter replies, you are the Christ, the Son of the living God. And Jesus answered him, blessed are you, Simon, son of Jonah, for flesh and blood has not revealed this to you, but my Father who is in heaven, I tell you, you are Peter, and on this rock I will build my church, and the gates of the grave, or the gates of hell, shall not prevail against it. I will give you the keys of the kingdom of heaven, and whatever you bind uh, will be bound on earth, and whatever you bind in heaven will be, or loose in, in heaven will be loose in heaven. Then he strictly charged his disciples to tell no one. So here's this pinnacle moment, right? Jesus says, who do you say that I am? And Peter responds, you are the Christ, the Son of the living God. Pinnacle moment. This, he proclaimed Jesus to be the Messiah, Jesus to be the one. Peter proclaims it, and Jesus' response is, Peter, man has not revealed that to you, but my Father has revealed that to you. I'm going to take that testimony. I'm going to take your, your evidence of that, and I'm going to build the church on the message of that fact that what you have proclaimed will become the building of the church. And by the way, that's true in Acts chapter 2. However, if you read this passage, it continues, and I'm going to read it exactly what it says. Right after this, it just continues. This is what it says. It says, from that time, Jesus began to show his disciples that he must go to Jerusalem and suffer many things from the elders and chief priests and scribes and be killed, and on the third day be raised. And Peter took him aside and began to rebuke him, saying, far be it from you, Lord, this shall never happen to you. And so Jesus turned and said to Peter, Get behind me, Satan. You are a hindrance to me. For you are not setting your mind on the things of God, but on the things of man. So do you just get what just happened? Peter says, Who do you say that I am? I am the, you are the Christ, the Son of the living God. You have done well, Simon. You have gotten it right. I am the Christ, the Son of the living God. I'm going to build the church on that. Just a few moments later, literally seconds later, 
Jesus is telling them that he's going to die and rise again. He's going to be taken captive. And Peter says, it says he pulls Jesus aside and rebukes him, which means to, to angrily lead someone, right? And he rebukes him, and Jesus says, you are like Satan. Get behind me. You, God hasn't revealed that to you, but you've gotten that from your own thoughts. So in one moment, Peter is getting things that are from God. In the next moment, he's saying things he shouldn't be saying, and he's rebuking Jesus. Do you think in that moment, Peter wants to go back and hit the restart button and stop and not say a word after declaring Jesus to be the Christ, the Son of the living God? You better believe it. I mean, he was just called Satan. Isn't it true? This is a little side note. Isn't it true? It's not just what we say at the beginning. It's always kind of how we keep going in our talk. If we would just be quiet, it usually works out okay. So hard to be quiet, isn't it? So hard to be quiet in those moments. And Peter here, in one moment, I mean, literally in one moment, Jesus is like, man, you got that from the Father, has revealed that to you. And the next moment, you're Satan. Get behind me. I mean, Peter, I think, would love to hit the restart button. Now, if you follow this, Peter continues this pattern. In fact, in Matthew 26, listen, this is powerful. Matthew 26, they're in the garden, the, the, the garden of Gethsemane. He's about ready to be betrayed by Judas. And listen to these words. It says, and when they had sung a hymn, they went out to the Mount of Olives. So the Passover meal ended, they go out to the Mount of Olives. And Jesus says to them, you will all fall away because of me this night. For it is written, I will strike the shepherd and the sheep of the flock will be scattered. But after I am raised up, I will go before you to Galilee. And Peter answers him and says, though they all fall away because of you, I will never fall away. Jesus said to him, truly I tell you this very night before the rooster crows, you would deny me three times. And Peter says to him, even if I must die with you, I would not deny you. I will not deny you even if I die. And all the disciples said the same. Now you know what happened, don't you? Judas comes up betrays Jesus. Jesus is taken captive. Obviously, Peter pulls out his sword, cuts the guy Malchus's ear off. Jesus heals the guy. That's part of that story. Then at a distance, Peter follows Jesus, and he finds himself following Jesus from kangaroo court to kangaroo court to the high priest, back to these courts that were just kangaroo courts. It was all set up, and Peter, it says, is outside warming his hands by a fire on charcoal, and on three occasions denies Jesus. Now, if you read the story, I don't know what would be worse is to betray Jesus or deny Jesus because the Bible says that Peter actually curses the name of Jesus. And it says he's actually looking at Jesus and curses him. I mean, read it. It's pretty intense. It's not just, oh, I don't know who you're talking about. It is he curses the name of Jesus. That's Peter, right? Anybody think at that moment Peter wanted to hit restart? I just for a moment, in, in my own human tendency, wonder, what, what does Peter, Peter feel like? I mean, right, because we know what happens. I mean, obviously, Jesus goes to the cross. Three days later, there's this powerful story. The tomb is empty. It says that John and Peter runs to the tomb. John beats him there, but they go to the tomb to see the empty tomb. Jesus shows up twice, but says nothing to Peter specifically that we see. You ever have that moment where you hurt someone and you wonder how they're going to respond to you and you wonder and you're worried about it and you wonder are they going to forgive you? Are they going to let it go? Can you imagine the embarrassment, the anger, the fear, the shame, the despair, the, the desire just to hit reset because, man, restart this thing because I have screwed up majorly. I have messed up un intensely. I deny Jesus. So, so here's Peter. Christ is risen. That's happy. But am I forgiven? Am I okay? Is our relationship okay with Christ? Will he forgive me? Uh, I imagine Peter was glad Christ was alive, but how about their relationship? What was it going to be like? Now, at this point, there was a little interaction. Here we come to John 21, and we get this interaction. At this point, Peter is still an utter failure. At this point, he was still the man that denied Jesus, and I find it very interesting how this begins. Peter saying in chapter 21, verse 3, I'm going to go fishing. You know what I think is very interesting about that, folks? Is that he does hit a restart button. He runs back to what he did in the beginning, doesn't he? 
He says, listen, I have messed up. I am a failure. I denied the one I followed for three and a half years. There's no way he can use me. There's no way he has any purpose in my life. So where am I going to go? I'm going to go back to the thing that I know I'm going to go back to fishing. Because that's all I'm good for. Which, by the way, every time we see Peter fishing, he's not that good. He runs back to what he knew. Now listen, I don't know what your restart is, but for them it was fishing. And maybe for you it's fishing. Now, no, by the way, nothing wrong with fishing, right? By the way, I don't think it's sinful here that he went back to fishing. I do think, uh, if I'm being honest, I think there's a, a bit of negligence here. I believe he's being careless. I believe he's being irresponsible. I believe he's being thoughtless. Anybody know what just happened? Just a few pages earlier, Jesus walked out of a grave. What should he be doing? I mean, he spent three and a half years with this man. You know what? If you walked some guy you spent three and a half years with, walked out of a grave, you'd be going to tell some people, wouldn't you? Not Peter. He finds himself with seven others or six others fishing. Why? Just want to restart. Just want to go back and reset. I'm a failure. There's no purpose. Obviously, he was at the right place. By the way, Jesus said, I'm going to come to Galilee. He was at the rendezvous point, but didn't know what to do. Right place, but old work. And here he was, and maybe, maybe you're like Peter, and you're casting your net in some quiet grove, kind of disillusioned with the mainstream of what God wants to do in your life. I mean, they were called as disciples, were they not? And now he returns to what he had been called out of. I think this is pretty intentional here. He, he goes back to what he was called out of. And many Christians, that's exactly what we do, right? Things start to go haywire. We have a moment of failure, and so what do we, we turn back to what we've been called out of. Peter's called out of fishing to be a disciple, and instead he goes back to fishing because he's not a very good disciple. Notice what happens. Verse 4. Just as day was breaking, Jesus stood on the shore, yet the disciples did not know that it was Jesus. Jesus called out to them and said, Children, do you have any fish? They answered him and said, No. And he said to them, cast the net on the right side of the boat and you will find some. So they cast it and now they were not able to haul it in because of the quantity of fish. And that disciple whom Jesus loved, and we know that's John. John John never names himself when he writes the gospel. He always calls himself the one whom Jesus loved because he rested on the breasts of Jesus. In fact, it says that. The one whom Jesus loved, therefore, said to Peter, it is the Lord. When Simon Peter heard that it was the Lord, he put on his outer garments, for he was stripped for work, and he threw himself into the sea. And the other disciples came into the boat, dragging the net full of fish, for they were not far from the land, but about a hundred yards off. So notice what happens. Um, Jesus shows up. They don't know it's Jesus. He tells them to cast the nets to the right side of the boat, the difference of seven and a half feet. Right, that's about the width of a boat in their day. Seven and a half feet. Jesus tells them, cast the nets on the other side of the boat. Um, Sound pretty familiar, doesn't it? Luke chapter 5. They then pull in all these fish. Success happens. John realizes who it is and looks at Peter and says, it's it's the Lord. And so Peter says, by the way, in their day, it literally says here he was naked because in their day a lot of fishermen would fish naked, maybe in their Fruit of a Looms boxers, I'm not sure. But the word there is he was naked, so he had to clothe himself in order to come to shore. Um, Praise the Lord he did that, right? And so he put on his outer garments, his, he put on his swimming cap, and he dives in and says they were 100 yards off. So we got a Michael Phelps here, a 100-meter swim, coming to him. And he comes to Jesus. The first time he bows before him here, it just says he runs to Christ. We don't see any other interaction at this point. Now, a couple things I want to point out, and I want to make some application points here. First of all, I believe like the disciples, many people identify themselves by failure instead of their calling and position in Christ. For many Christians, they are being held back by their own failures. They're being held back by by their moments of, of disruption and despair instead of by the call of Christ. Right? So, so what do we talk about most in our lives? We talk about our failures, our mess-ups, and what we're really doing in our insecurity is making excuses for our lives. Instead of the calling we have in Christ as followers of him to follow him. Instead, what we do is we, we identify ourselves by just the failure. Instead of, man, I've been called by Christ. I've been, I have been positioned by Christ in his family. By the way, I find it, don't you find it really unique that Jesus calls out to them, children, I don't know about you, but if I was Jesus, I would call out, hey, bums, who should be telling everybody I was, rose again, what are you doing? Instead, he calls out, children, do you have any fish? Love that. Very tender here. He calls them children. 
that, so, so this idea that we identify ourselves in this way, I, I find it interesting they return to their failure. They return to what God had called them from. Uh, notice, by the way, I, I love what kind of happens next, verse 9. When they got out on the land, they saw a charcoal fire in place with fish laid out on it and bread. Anybody find interesting that the disciples were out in the ocean, out in the sea, fishing and got nothing? They come to shore and Jesus already had fish frying. Do you know both times that we see Jesus, we see the, these men fishing, these professional fishermen fishing, the two times we see them fishing, they only caught fish when Jesus showed up. And I want to make a second point from this. And I don't want to read into this too much, but I, I'm trying to apply this to our lives in our moment of failure. I think Peter here is in a moment of failure. I think he's overwhelmed. He's trying, he, he didn't know what to restart. So he's hitting the restart button. He's going back fishing. And I find it interesting that, that in our place of restart, Christ's presence is there. Jesus shows up, and not only their moment of calling, but in their moment of despair, his presence is right there. And it, nothing happens until they realize Christ is there. I find it interesting, Jesus' presence is there. Listen, you're, you're here in your life, and you're in a moment of despair. You've messed up. You, man, you, you've gotten something wrong. In that moment, Christ is there. I know that's easy to grasp. I mean, it's easy to say. It's hard to grasp, isn't it? Man, even when I'm a failure, Christ is present. He's there. Here he's making fish. Uh, by the way, I, a couple of side notes I want to point out that I think are beautiful that if I skip over, I, I, I would say, I would regret that I didn't share this. Do you know what's interesting? The word charcoal that's found in this verse, you see that word charcoal? It says that he was making fish over the charcoal, verse uh, 9. That word only shows up twice. Anybody want to guess where the first time it shows up is? It's only found twice in the New Testament. The word charcoal, specifically. You know the other, only other place it shows up? Is when Jesus, I mean, it's when Peter is warming his hands over the fire as Jesus is going to a trial and he denies him. I just wonder. Now, again, I don't want to read into it too much. I just wonder when Peter comes to shore and he sees a barrel of charcoal, if maybe he thinks back just a few days earlier when he was standing over the last barrel of charcoal that he stood by warming his hands, and he was denying Jesus. And here was Jesus with charcoal and a fire making fish. Just wonder. Just wonder. I think that's pretty amazing. This is the only other place it shows up in the New Testament. Notice what ends up happening. So Simon Peter went aboard, verse 11, and hauled the net ashore full of large fish, 153 of them. Now, there have been some people that have said, well, why 153? Um, and, you know, scholars debate that kind of stuff. By the way, if you do, like, Greek numerics, Greek letters have numbers. That's a kind of a modern thing. It wasn't back then, but uh, there's a numeric system. So the name Peter actually adds up to 153 in Greek numerics. Just a side note. Some believe maybe it stood for the law and, and, and the Gospels. I don't know. To be honest, they're fishermen. You know what you do when you get a big fish, a big catch? What do you do? You count them, don't you? You, you know, like football teams, college football teams, they put the little stickers on their helmet. Why did they do that? Because they made a great play, right? You had a great play today, we're going to give you a Buckeye sticker. Or we're going to give you, right, some of those helmets. You, you know what I'm talking about with college football fans? All right? That's how they, this idea, right? Is they're counting the fish. I just think they're generically saying, we got 153 fish, man. Let's cook them up. Let's sell them. This is great. And although there were so many, the net was not torn. And Jesus said, verse 12, come and have breakfast. There's the invitation. I'm here. Yeah, you, you, you went to your restart, but I'm right here. My presence is here. Come and have breakfast with me. Now, none of the disciples dared ask, who are you? They knew it was the Lord. And Jesus came and took bread and gave it to them. And so with the fish. This was now the third time that Jesus was revealed to the disciples after he was raised from the dead. Now, up until this point, we have Peter. And there's been no conversation with Christ that we know of. Maybe hello, he comes in, maybe it's, it's right? You, you know those moments where you're seeing somebody and it's kind of that first time that you've seen him in a while and it was awkward the last time and now it's really awkward. I wonder if it was like that. How you doing? I'm fine, how about you? Isn't the weather great? How about the game today? Go Skins? Go Cowboys? Uh, whoever? Right, that's what you do, right? It's awkward. Can you imagine? I wonder if Peter here is awkward. Notice who takes the initiative here. Verse 15. 
And when they had finished breakfast, Jesus said to Simon Peter, Jesus initiates this conversation, this awkward conversation that needs to happen. I want to spend some time here before we end this morning. It says, Jesus said to Simon Peter, Simon, son of John, do you love me more than these? He said to him, yes, Lord, you know that I love you. By the way, I love the fact that he says, do you love me more than these? I think these these go back to the fish, goes back to the position. I think it could also go back to the disciples. It doesn't specify. But I think directly it could be, do you love me more than the fishing? Do you love me more than your restart? Do you love me more than you run to? Do you love me more than these, even, even these disciples? Do you love me more than these? And, and Peter says, yeah, I love you. He, he says to him, yes, Lord, you know that I love you. He said to him, feed my lambs. Verse 16, he said to him a second time, Simon, son of John, do you love me? And he says, yes, Lord, you know that I love you. He said to him, tend my sheep. Verse 17, he said to him a third time, Simon, son of John, do you love me? Peter was grieved because he said it a third time, do you love me? And he says, Lord, you know everything. You know that I love you. Jesus said to him, feed my sheep. Truly, truly, I say to you, when you were young, you used to dress yourself and walk wherever you want. But when you're old, you will stretch out your hands and another will dress you and carry you where you do not want to go. This is, this he said to show by what kind of death he was to glorify God. And after saying this, he said to him, follow me. Now, this conversation, we get... I don't know about you, but I can be a bit nosy. I like to eavesdrop. I like to listen to what other people say, right? You ever do that? Don't pretend I'm the only one that does that. <laughs> right? And so, you know, you know how the, there's a conversation happening, and you kind of walk up close enough where you can listen, and you kind of go, now, I don't want you to think I do that all the time. I, I do it with a godly heart. Um, no, I'm just I'm kidding. <laughs> I'm kidding. You know what I'm talking about, Right? I want you to get this because I think this is pretty powerful. When we think about this in the text we get to read, we get to eavesdrop on a conversation with Jesus and Peter. And I think what is most beautiful about this is not what is said, but what isn't said. Because if I was Jesus, I'd come up to Peter and say, Peter, listen, we got to talk, dude. You remember what you did after the garden? Remember how you said you would go to death for me? Where were you, dude? Where were you, bro? I was waiting on you. You weren't even at my cross. You didn't even come see me. I was always dying for you. Man, you, you act all big, Peter. Where are you at now? Knucklehead? And I would smack him on the back of the head. Peter, how could you? Peter, are you sorry for what you've done? Now, don't ever do it again, right? That's what we say as parents. Don't ever do that again, right? That's what I would have said. Jesus comes up and says, in the most beautiful way, Peter, do you love me? In spite of the fact that he could have said, Peter, you're a knucklehead and you're worthless. The most beautiful thing is not just what is said, it's what isn't said. But Peter comes up and says, do you love me? Now, there is an interaction here that I want to pull out that I think our English cannot give. It can't. And the reason for that is because we have one word for love, right? So I say, and you've heard me say this before, I love pizza or I love steak and I love my wife. Clearly, I don't love steak like I love my wife. Now, there might be a little layover of that, but I don't go up to my wife and go, man, I just love you. You're tasty. And if I do, that's none of your business, okay? <laughs> right? I, don't, I love my wife much different than I love my steak. I, I say I love my kids, and I can also say I love college basketball. I don't love my kids like I love college basketball. At least I shouldn't. There's an issue if I do. I love my kids much more than college basketball, but I don't have any other word to say it. I can say I like it. That's kind of the word we use to try to differentiate, but there's one word. In both Hebrew and Greek, there are multiple words to define love. And there are three words in the New Testament Greek. There are four words. Three are seen in the Bible. One of them is the word eros in Greek. It is the word erotic love. It is intimate love, sexual love in many ways. It's a personal love you have with your spouse. It's, it is meant to be. The, the, the other love is, is a, a word called phileo. Phileo is the word brotherly love, love but a close-knit brotherly love. Not just, hey, you're, 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 you're my bro, I love you. It's just, I, I love you like a brother. Um, but it's relational love, but not a deep love. This is where we get the city of Philadelphia. It's the city of brotherly love, phileo. The, the, the third kind and the, and the most important kind is this word agape, or in, in the verb, aga, agapao. Literally, this word agapao means a self-sacrificial, 
unconditional love. So in Hebrew, uh, Ephesians chapter 5, it says, Husbands, love your wives as Christ of the church. The word there is the word agape or agapeo. I am to love my wife as Christ of the church, self-sacrificially, unconditionally. I love her. That's the calling uh, to husbands. Love your wife as Christ of the church. This is the love that God calls for us as Christians. Agape. Now, phileo is used, but agape. Agape. This is what's interesting. Jesus comes to Peter and says, Peter, do you agape me? Do you agapao me? Do you self-sacrificially love me? Now, Peter before would have answered, no doubt. I'm willing to die for you. I love you. Except here, this first time he answers and says, Lord, you know that I phileo you. You know what we're finding here? We're finding a humble Peter. He realizes he cannot say that he is sacrificing, willing to self-sacrifice himself in love. Jesus says, do you agape me? Peter responds with, I phileo you. The second time, Jesus comes and says, do you agape me? Do you agapao me? Do you self-sacrificially love me? Peter responds again, Lord, you know I phileo you. I love you like a brother, a close-knit relative. Jesus asks the third time. What's interesting is Jesus changes it. I think here it's interesting that he does it three times in the same way that Peter denies Jesus three times. And Jesus says the third time, Peter, do you phileo me? And Peter responds, Lord, you know all things. Now stop for a moment. Do you remember the last time they had an interaction in the garden? Jesus says, you're all going to be scattered. And Peter says, Lord, you're crazy. I'm not going to leave you. I'm going to die for you. What is he saying in that statement? The Lord doesn't know what he's talking about. And now, in this moment, Jesus says, do you love me? Phileo. And Peter says, Lord, you know all things. You know that I phileo. Which the implication is, Lord, you know I cannot say I agapao you because I clearly did not show you self-sacrificial love. I am not there. I don't know if I can love you like that. I don't know if I'm there yet. And I'm gonna, I think we're looking at Peter being very, very honest here. Very, very honest and saying, I phileo you. And Jesus was testing him. See, I think this is the third point I would pull out when we talk about restart. How we respond in our failure is a greater demonstration of our love than mere verbal declaration. What do I mean by that? I think it's real easy for us to say, Lord, I love you. I love you, Lord. And I lift my voice right. It's zero easy to sing that. But how we respond in our failure is a greater demonstration of love than just merely declaring it. Peter, I'll die for you, Lord. Lord, I don't know. I don't know if I can say I agape you. I can say I phileo you. I don't know if I'm there. I believe Christ wants us to be honest with where we're at with him. And that's the problem with restarts is we're trying, to, we're trying to hide it. Instead of saying, Lord, I don't know if I love you. Man, I want to hit the button. I want to, I want to try again. And guess what God does in that is God develops our love for him. I, I think it's awesome here that Jesus accepts the fact that he doesn't say, I agapao you. I, don't, I love you unconditionally. He says, no, I'll take phileo. I'll take your love that is measly compared to what it should be, Peter, and I'll take it. Now follow me. Follow me. Follow me. Love this picture here. By the way, isn't it Peter who writes in 1 Peter chapter 4? Get this. Peter writes in multiple letters that we can read in the New Testament. And in chapter 4 verse 8 he says, Love covers a multitude of sin. It was Peter that wrote that. Wait, I'm a failure. I've denied Jesus. No, no, no. The love of Christ covers that multitude of sin. He's the restart. I punch the button and and, and Christ is willing to forgive. And it cleanses from all unrighteousness. Now listen, I'm not talking about an excuse to go sin anymore. I'm talking about not restarting every single time and going back to the same sin over and over and over again that we keep thinking is going to restart our life. And what ends up happening is it denies Christ even more. I, by the way, I think in this text, we see that Peter still doesn't get the gospel, does he? He still doesn't get why Jesus died or why Jesus rose again. If he got it, he would have said, Lord, thank you for forgiving me. Instead, he comes and says, I don't know what I'm doing. I don't know where I'm at. 
See, he didn't understand the gospel. He didn't understand the resurrection. He still didn't grasp it. As someone once said, you know, God has said he takes our sin and throws it as far as the east is from the west to be remembered no more. And he puts a sign on the outside of the ocean, no fishing. No fishing. Now, to think that Peter here gets it would be wrong. I want to show you one more thing and we're finished. Take a look at what happens. So Jesus says, do you love me? He admits in a humble way, I love you, but not in the way that I need to. There's a lot of work that needs to be done. He says, now follow me, Peter. Notice what happens, verse 20. Lest you think that all of a sudden the story ends and Peter's great and grand, and yes, Peter is going to preach in Acts chapter 2, and 3,000 people are going to give their lives to Christ, and even more, because it doesn't count women and children, more give their lives to Christ. So he's going to be the mouthpiece of, uh, of the gospel. But, watch. Verse 19, this he was showing what kind of death he was to glorify God. So Peter is told, you're going to die, but you're going to glorify God. And after saying this, he said to him, follow me. Jesus says, follow me. Now watch. Peter turned. Immediately after Jesus says, follow me, where does he go? He doesn't follow, he turns. Peter turns and saw the disciple whom Jesus loved following them. This is John, talking about John. The one who has, was reclining at the table close to him and said, Lord, who is it that's going to betray you? And when Peter saw John, he said to Jesus, Lord, what about this man? See what just happened? Peter realized that Jesus was the restart, and so he went right back into the same pattern he demonstrated over and over again. He goes back and compares himself, doesn't he? He says, who's going to deny you? Is it this guy? Is it John? I love what Jesus says. Jesus says to him, if it is my will that he remain until I come, what is that to you? And this is imperative here. This is a command. This is an absolute declaration you follow me. You follow me. You know what Jesus just says there? Listen, dude, give it up. Don't go back there, Peter. Don't compare yourself. Don't, don't look there. Follow me. You follow me. He still didn't get it here. Jesus says, no, you follow me. Last point, Jesus restores us by causing us to face our point of failure then challenges us to set our eyes on the work ahead. Jesus does not call us to continue to look back at all the things that we've done, all the misery, all the failure that many people live their life in and identify themselves in. He says, listen, I am the ultimate restart button. You come to me, I forgive. Now put your eyes ahead on the task at hand. You look back, you feel misery. You look forward, you see glory. You look back, you feel horrible. You look forward, you see worthwhile. You see worthy, worthy things. You th see something that can be done for the glory of God by him in your life. He says, hey, don't, don't look back. Listen, you, if you look back, if you look back, failure will become a person. But failure is not a person. Failure is an event that a person does. What Jesus is saying here is, listen, let's not let that define us. He said, he's willing to forgive, to, to let it go, and now follow him. Follow him. Honor him. Live for him. Now, as we, as we close, and uh, there's so much in this little passage that we could spend days talking about. I really believe that. This is rich and deep to think about these things. Uh, Jesus says, listen, it, you follow me. You hear this morning, and I don't know about you, but... This story to me is, is one of liberating wonder, hope-filled truth. To think that failure is not, failure is not just who I am. Failure, failure does not have to affect what I look like going forward. See, see some of us, we, we, we continue the pattern of just, I'm going to restart, start over. I'm going to restart, start over. And we got this cycle. I keep running back to the restart button. I keep restarting, but I keep going back to the same things I do every time. And I find myself in the same situation tomorrow, and I'm restarting and trying it again. Jesus says, no, no, no. Come and eat fish with me. I love Revelation 3.10. It says, behold, I stand at the door and knock. If anyone comes to me, by the way, he's writing that to the church. He says, if anyone comes to me, if anyone opens the door, I will come in, and I will dine with him. I'll have fellowship with him. He stands at the door and knocks. He says, let's have fellowship together. Let's, that man, you want to restart? Come back. Come to me. That's where you go. Not back to fishing. Not back to the habit. Not back to the old cycle of things. He says, come and dine with me. Come and sit with me for a while.
I believe only those who greatly fail can appreciate this story, and I think we all can if we really grasp. And here's the questions I want to ask this morning. How long are you going to stay in a season that's over? Some of you are staying in a season that's over. How long are you going to sit in a season that's over? How long are you going to relive the pain that's already been passed? How are you going to stay stuck in what is or what might have been, what was, and forget what can be? You're missing out on what can be in the Lord. It's interesting. I remember hearing this story. I love history, but uh, the story is told Julius Caesar. uh, When they were conquering the world, he was sending the Roman soldiers all over the world. They found themselves, and he personally led a huge troop, uh, troop team or you know, centurions and all these different soldiers to England or Great Britain at the time. Obviously, Great Britain wasn't what it is today or even hundreds of years ago. This is back in the, in the second or the first century. But he led them there in Britain to, to take over that land. And, of course, the Roman Empire was one of the largest ever. And so uh, he was leading his soldiers and they came to this area. It was called the Cliffs of Dover. You can still go there today. You can look over the cliffs that Julius Caesar stood upon. But the story is told that as they climbed the cliff, they got out of the boats, they climbed up the mountain to the top, and he asked all of his soldiers, after they climbed to the top, to stand at the edge of the cliff and look over the Cliff of Dover and look into the ocean. And all the soldiers, as they looked out into the ocean, you know what they saw? They saw every one of their ships burning. Julius Caesar had them all set on fire. The reason for that was because he was trying to demonstrate, listen, you will never set foot out of this continent again. You're not going to return to Rome ever again. We're going to battle here. This is where we're going to advance. The only place I want you to look is not back at the ships. I want you to look forward in advancement. I think so many Christians live their life through the rearview mirror instead of looking out of the glass and seeing what God wants to do in their life, how God forgives and uses us for his glory. Peter, I believe, is a prime example of that. He looked back, he said, I'm going back fishing. I'm going back to what I was. I'm no good. I'm no use. And God says, listen, let me take who you are. I'll take your measly phileo love, and I'll use it for my glory. Of course, Peter, in Acts chapter 2, stood before the people and proclaimed the gospel, and thousands came to know Christ. If John 21 didn't happen, that doesn't happen. Peter would have remained a fisherman and may even became the most famous fisherman in, in Israel at the time. I don't know. Instead, God used him for his glory because he was willing to see Jesus is the restart. Jesus is where we run. Jesus is where we go in those moments of failure and misery and despair and embarrassment. We find him to be our strength. We find him to be our God. We find him who is able to take evil and turn to what is good. Let's stand together as we pray this morning.